So you're going to get an example kind of what a Tuesday night Bible study is. So we've been on this series where we're talking about how do we agree with our identity. And the message I was going to do was going to be on the temptations of Jesus. Because what we're doing is we're looking at a story from the life of Jesus and a similar concept in Paul. And we're bringing them together to see what we learn about our identity and who we are in Christ. But I thought, before we talk about how Satan tempts us, we should probably talk about what the Bible says about Satan. Because there's a lot of misconceptions. And I want to plow through this because I want to give you a chance to ask questions at the end. Okay? Because Paul says, we can't be uninformed about our enemy and about his schemes and about his, his techniques. And so I want to take a chunk of time just to talk about how, what we understand about the nature of Satan. Is that fair? I, I know two weeks ago we did Christus Victor, talking about all the things that the atonement happened, and last week was the Trinity. I wanted to give you a mental break, and this is going to be it. Is that, this is all you get, folks, so this is as light as it gets. So with all that in mind, let's go back to our concept. This is what we're trying to get through for this series. The degree you agree with your identity. This is who you actually are in your spirit in Jesus. What Jesus did on the cross does, is who you are. Our choice is, do I agree with it or not? Do I agree with Jesus inside of me, or do I agree with my internal glutton? Okay? And the degree I agree with the identity is the degree I walk in victory over sin, over circumstances. I embody his glory. I become the person in my world that people go to when they need a breakthrough. This is what Jesus wants for all of you, to be your own spiritual hub. But ultimately, to apply his authority. And the subject of, of authority is going to come up next week in the temptations. But first, I want to break it down a little. But before we get there, we remember, yes, it ha takes faith to believe in your identity in Christ. But we already have faith. It's just right now our faith is in our emotions and not the word of God. Right? Right? Thank you. So this is the only slide we have today until we get to our affirmations. And here's the reason I want to talk about this. The story of Satan pops up in the book of Luke like crazy. And that's what we're going through. You see the power of the Spirit working in the lives of Zacharias and Elizabeth. You see the power of the Spirit bringing the incarnation inside of Mary. You see the power of the Holy Spirit when Jesus gets baptized. And then what we're going to see next week is the power of the Spirit leads him out into the wilderness. For what reason? To be tempted. Okay? And then as soon as Jesus is tempted, he goes into a church and a demon recognizes. says, I know who you are. You're, you're the Son of God. Basically, what are you doing on this planet? And then... Peter's mom is sick, and he rebukes the fever. So you see this conflict. So the question is, where does it begin? I think, I think the first place you really see the power of the enemy is in Genesis chapter 1. And by the way, let me be really specific about something. The name Satan, or in Hebrew, ha-Satan, means adversary. A lot of times we think it just means accuser. Well, if somebody is accusing you, they certainly aren't your friend, Right? But the core word of ha-satan is adversary, opponent. And I think you see it in Genesis chapter 1. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? But what's the next thing you see? And the earth became null and void. There's a theory that goes around that says after God created everything, Satan and his angels got expelled from heaven. They went to this planet, and they started destroying what God created. Now, again, it's, it's not 100% discussed in the Bible, but it's alluded to. I don't have a problem with that theory, because what you see then in, in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, the rest of it, is God recreating from what he already started. So he's separating the waters. He's moving the lands around. So he created it once. It got attacked to be destroyed. And then what you see in what we call creation is actually re creation. Okay? Does that make sense? But if you don't believe that, that's fine. It's not a, it's not a make or break issue. Because certainly in Genesis chapter 3, who do we meet? We meet the serpent. 
And the serpent's job is to get you to distrust God. That's all he has to do. The enemy's job is to ask a question. What is it going to take to make Rose discouraged? What is it going to take to make Joy discouraged? He's got your name in hell. And the question is, what is going to discourage him? Because once he discourages you, once he gets you to doubt the goodness of God, he's made his way in, and you start agreeing with him. See, all of life is a question. Who are you going to agree with? Are you going to agree with Jesus? And we call that Christianity. Or are you going to agree with your own brain and disagree with Jesus, which leads you on the path that the enemy wants you on? sense? It's fairly simple. And the lies start. Did God really say that? You know what? If you ate that apple, you'd be like God. And that's the crux of what sin is. Becoming your own God. I think that's good. I don't care what God says. I think that will give me life. I don't care what God says. And so I will eat, I will smoke, I will drink, I will run around, I will sleep with, I will do with my time whatever I want to because I'm my own God. But let's go back to the prehistory for a second. Because what we really understand about Satan and his demons has to happen before the world was ever created. We believe the Bible paints a picture of Lucifer was the high angel that became Satan. And he was the worship leader, and he wanted all the worship for himself and not for God. Which is why one of the central temptations is, as we said, worship me. And on some level, he convinced a third of the angels to rebel against God. And by the way, folks, even though we're going to talk about the devil today, it's not big Satan, big God. No, it's little Satan, huge God. Is that completely clear? All right. Jack Hayford says, the good news is in the entire universe, the devil and his angels only infest one planet. The bad news is it's this one. Okay? God has the whole universe in his hands, but the devil's got this planet in his grip. And our job is to rip off his grip amongst those we love. So Satan gets a third of the angels to come with him. And by the way, folks, I want you to remember something. Everything God creates, he gives the power to rebel. All right? In the Garden of Eden, who's rebelling? A created animal. What's he talking about? A created piece of fruit. Everything God creates, he gives the right to rebel. Why? Because love requires a choice. You have to have the choice to choose love, and you have to have the choice to not. So that's where the prehistory comes in. And I'm going to get to that a little bit more in in a second. But if you really want to understand the working of of the enemy in the Old Testament, the place you want to look is at Israel's enemies. Because while Israel is God's chosen people, every other nation is under under the authority and under the attack of the enemy. So if you want to know what God, what Satan is like, look at what he does to Pharaoh. It's a perfect example of somebody who hates God's people. And what does Pharaoh do? He oppresses them. He makes their life horrible to get, to exploit out of them what he wants to, which, by the way, is what most dictators do, right? Exploiting people to get what he wants. And then when it looks like he can't do it anymore, he lies. Okay, I'll let him go. And then he comes back and says, no, I'm not going to let him go. Anyone here have a friend or family member who's beaten addiction for a short period of time? Uh, All of us, right? (laughs) And and, and that's what we see. When you look at any other of the war situations, when you look at the Old Testament, you see the working of the enemy in war situations. In the New Testament, it's in spiritual situations. Does that make sense? Because what you have to remember is Satan isn't talked about much in the Old Testament. There's really only one place in the Old Testament where you can unequivocally say that the Satan that is being talked about is the same that's talked about in the New Testament. uh, 18 of the 24 times the word Satan appears in the Old Testament. It's talking about a physical adversary of Israel's. It's only when Jesus comes that he comes and he gives the fuller revelation. Uh, Let's talk about Job for a second. So this is where most people, I think, get really confused. 
If you open up the book of Job, it talks about, you, you see this, this early picture of the meetings of the sons of God, and this, this interloper comes in, and you see God going, what are you doing here? Like, he's not supposed to be there, all right? And he goes, well, I was just walking around the earth to and fro. God says, have you noticed my, ser my servant Job? Satan says, oh, he only serves you because you bless him. If you lift, if you strike your hand against him, he will curse you. Now, friends, everybody has to get this. Look at me. Everybody look at me, because you can't leave here and not get this. God doesn't attack Job. That's the whole part people miss. Satan says, if you put your hand against them, God doesn't. What does God say? He's in your control. Now, Christians for hundreds of years have said, well, God gave up his control to Satan. No! Job was already in Satan's control. God says, just don't strike him. But guess what Satan does? He strikes him anyway. The first round goes, Satan comes back to Job and says, well, yeah, you know, but, but if you make him really sick... God doesn't say, okay, I'll make him really sick. No. Satan is doing all of the stuff in Job. This is the whole crux of the story. Human beings are walking around clueless of what's going on in the spirit. Does that make sense? And let me clarify one thing. I've never heard anybody say this, so if you don't agree with me, don't worry, you're probably right. Have you ever wondered why God doesn't just do more? Here's why. I believe. Remember when God said to Satan, just don't physically touch him, and then eventually he says, just don't kill him? I believe, and again, you don't have to agree with me. I believe that's God's relationship with Satan when it comes to all of us. We are on the planet that is the domain of Satan. That's what Jesus says, that's what Paul says. And God says, don't. God puts limits, right? But you know what Satan does and his angels do? They cheat. God doesn't. Okay? How do I have proof of this? How many TV shows do you watch where the good guys want to catch the bad guys, but they can't because the good guys have to obey laws. Uh, how about all of them? I mean, has an episode of Law & Order ever been on where the good detectives aren't limited by some kind of... I mean, isn't that the whole crux of the TV show, Law & Order, that we watch obsessively for 25 years to watch the good guys under the bounds of the law get the bad guy, Right? And how often do we watch the show where the good guy breaks the rules to get the bad guy? I mean, NYPD Blue, my favorite TV show of all time, had Sipowicz. He'd catch the guy, he'd beat the snot out of him. And I'd go, yeah! <laughs> right? I like the thought that a good guy's going to break the law to get the bad guy. Don't we? Don't we? God won't. Satan won't. Satan will. Is that fair? Again, you don't have to agree with this. I, I can't necessarily point to Bible to prove it. But the Bible says, in, as it is in the natural, so it is in the spiritual. There's a mirror effect that goes on. That's why every dictator looks the same. Every dictator rises to power, keeps power, and uses his power to kill people, to exploit people. Have you noticed that? Stalin, Pol Pot, Baby Doc, Hitler... All of, these, all of these horrible dictators do exactly the same thing. Kill people in mass numbers. Right? It's because I believe this is the enemy's plan in everything. And you know, let's go back to Job for a second. So how does the book of Job end? Job holds on to his righteousness and blames God. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. And that sounds really pious. But Job doesn't know what went on in heaven, Right? His friends blame Job. You must really be sinful because bad things can't happen to good people. You heard that one before? Have you seen Jesus and realized that that's just not true? What does God say? 
Job, were you there when I wrestled behemoth? God had to wrestle a spiritual force. Were you there when I set up the boundaries, forcing something into submission? God says to Job, you don't know what you're talking about. There are things going on around you that are far bigger than you. And that's why Job says, I repent. Okay? Job blamed God. How many people have someone in their life who's blaming God for things that went wrong? Job's friends blame Job because they couldn't believe that someone who has, does things right is going to get messed up. Anybody here have a Christian look down their nose at you when your life goes sideways because they think, well, you just must not have enough faith. Right? What does God blame? The cosmos, the world we live in. He says, this is a dangerous place. It's always been a dangerous place, but I'm always good. Does that make sense? If there is a mystery to the problem of evil, it's not in God's character. God is always good. God is always on the side of life. For the, for the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And, and folks, if ever you get into a conversation with somebody who wants to say that God's in control of everything and, and that, that evil might happen, but God has a sovereign will, we can't understand. God's ways are so confusing. No, God's ways aren't confusing. He wants everybody to look like Jesus. That's not confusing, is it? He wants everybody to use their free will to choose his will. This is why Jesus had to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Right? Just ask somebody. If you get into an argument with them and they just want to talk about God being all controlling, say, well then how can we fight evil if God is behind evil? Right? Right? Somebody says, God has a mysterious plan. Well, if God has a mysterious plan, why should I invest my life fighting evil? Because God might be in, in the midst of it. I don't want to fight God. And everywhere Jesus went, what did you see him do when he came up to somebody who's suffering? Did he ever stop and say, well, you know, it might be God's will. No. Everybody who was sick, he healed he never, he never made somebody sick so that he could heal them later. When the leper comes and says, if you're willing, make me clean, Jesus says, I'm willing. <laughs> right? Right? It's not big devil, big God. It's little devil, huge God. Satan just has a head start. Is, is, this, is this fair? Is this making sense? I'm going to jump to the intertestamental period for a second because here's what you have to notice. The Old Testament says virtually nothing about Satan. Virtually nothing. Jesus, from the get-go, is fighting Satan 100% of the time. Would you agree? If you've read the Bible, this is true? Let me clarify one thing. The reason the Old Testament says nothing about God, I'm sorry, it says nothing about Satan, Someone's going to edit that out sometime. Sean Lumsden said, the Old Testament says nothing about God. The reason the Old Testament says nothing about Satan is because God teaches in the Old Testament one puzzle piece at a time. If your four-year-old comes up to you and says, how did the baby get in the woman's belly? Are you going to go into a full dissertation on sexual congress for a four-year-old? Please say no. Please say no. Good. Okay? What Chris talks about to 12, 14, 15, 16-year-olds is far more advanced than what we would say to 4-year-olds. Would you agree? In the Old Testament, they're surrounded by polytheists, hundreds of thousands of gods. So what does the Old Testament want to make clear? There is one God. One God. All right? 
And that's why it's so important when Moses says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, because the Israelites were trying to make a God out of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers. They're still trying to be polytheistic. And Moses goes, No, <laughs> there's one. As the story unfolds, more puzzle pieces are put in. This is what we call the intertestamental period. The 400 years that between Malachi and Matthew, people were still writing, people were still teaching, and this concept of Satan starts to develop. So that when Jesus comes along, everybody knows about the devil, nobody's debating it, and everybody knows that, that God is the force of good and Satan is the force of evil. And this is why, and we're going to see this in the next few, few weeks of the book of Luke, what does Jesus do everywhere he goes? He sets people free. He heals them. He teaches them about the, about the kingdom. And here's a fascinating fact, okay? Do you know who the first people were who recognized, besides Mary, the first beings were that recognized that Jesus was God? You know who it was? Demons. Can't make this stuff up, folks. Okay? So what does Jesus do? Every time he sees somebody, he sees them as a prisoner of war. And he sets them free. What does Paul talk about? Paul talks about the spiritual war constantly. Constantly. He, he talks about different ranks. He but he, they always come back to what Jesus did on the cross, won the war. Christian's job is to enforce the victory. I go back to this analogy so that hopefully you can say this to your friends. When Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation of Proclamation, legally every slave was free. Experientially, they were still experiencing the hangover of slavery, correct? It took the North to go down city by city, plantation by plantation, and individually set every slave free so they could be practically free as they were legally free, right? This is where we are. Jesus has won the victory. He's paid for our sin. He's paid the ransom. He's redeemed us. He's taken back the authority. He's won our salvation. He's won our healing. He puts it all in our hands and says, now go set everybody free. Oh, that was the worst amen you guys have ever done. <laughs> Does that make sense? Jesus has completely won the victory. When the Allies invaded Normandy, World War II was essentially over. More people died after that than they did leading up to it. You still had the march into Stalingrad. You still had Pearl Harbor. You still had all of these deaths, even though the war was technically over. This is where we are. Our job is to set free those people who Jesus already set free. Amen? Um, in fact, this is how the whole book of Revelation ends up. With Satan and his angels being thrown in hell. Let me just say a couple things really quick. Good Christians can debate on the nature of hell. Okay? It's not an essential issue. Your studies may bring you to one conclusion. My studies may bring you to another, another conclusion. There's one thing that is absolutely non-negotiable, though. Hell is the final encapsulation of evil. All the evil you have ever faced on this planet will eventually be locked up in hell with Satan and his angels because that's who hell was created for. Okay? If anybody is in hell, it's not because God wants them to go there. And it is absolutely not because God only picks a few people to be elect and says everybody else can go to hell. All right? If you want a way to explain it, hell is a loving God giving people what they love most. And that's independence from God. Okay? God will not force anybody into heaven. If you don't love God now, he's not going to force you to spend eternity with him. If you don't want anything to do with Christians now, he's not going to force you to spend eternity with them. If you don't like worshiping God now, you're not going to like it anymore after you're dead. That's what makes this planet and every decision so important. It's because it leads to eternal destinies. If you don't agree with Jesus now, 
You're not going to agree with Jesus after you die, folks. Right? If you're angry and bitter at a Christian right now, and you're holding on to that, and that's why you don't want to follow Jesus, well, guess what? You're, God's going to say, okay, fine. It, it comes down to this. You're either going to say, thy will be done and serve God, or after you die, God's going to say to you, thy will be done. He's not going to force anybody to spend time with him in heaven. Why? Because that would be unloving. And free will is required to love. Absolutely, totally required to love. So hell is the final encapsulation of evil. That part you can't debate. And hell is a loving God giving people what they love most. Independence from him. Do you think you can share that at some point? All right. Come on. Joe, I think I froze. Can you click me forward? <clears throat> Just do the right arrow. It'll be fine. There you go. Oh, go back. Now it caught up. So here is our affirmations. And I took these from a couple weeks ago. And I really want you to catch something. You are a new creation. So what is the enemy going to tell you? What's the lie that he's going to tell you? You're the same old, same old. Nothing is ever going to change. You screwed up in the past, you're going to screw it up in the future. Remember something, friends. Everything the devil tells you in your mind, you can find the truth. Just go 180 degrees from it, because that is what God is trying to tell you. God's going to say in Ephesians chapter 3, I am God's work of art created for good works. What's the devil going to tell you? You're nothing but a bag of plasma marching to your own DNA. You know how I know that? Because that's what the atheists are writing. We're nothing more than a series, than we're a bag of plasma marching to our own DNA. We're nothing more than just electrical impulses. The love a mother has for, his for her child is nothing more than the march of evolution getting mixed up into the brain waves. Okay. What does God say? No, you are my work of art. You have great things ahead of you. You have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. The Bible says, I am an overflowing vessel of the Holy Spirit. The enemy is going to tell you, you are an overflowing vessel of bitterness, anger, fear, and anxiety. And don't worry, you can't accomplish anything because you're overflowing of fear, anger, bitterness, and anxiety. Ever hear that one before? But no, you're overflowing of the Holy Spirit. All of your anger, bitterness, and anxiety went on the cross. Jesus doesn't even remember it. I am a representative of Jesus to my world. Satan's going to say, no, you are a representative of getting as much as you can get to make yourself as comfortable as possible. And the last thing you want to do is, is help somebody else unless they can help you back. You got to hurt them before they hurt you. Anyone ever have that one bounce around in your brain? I got to break up with them before they break up with me. Anyone have that one kick around? No, Jesus says you're the representative. You're his representative. You get to go show people what self-sacrificial love looks like. The Bible would say that we enforce Jesus' victory to our world and we love the fight. Satan wants to say, oh, but I'm so tired. I can't pray tonight. I'm so tired. And if I try to pray for more than five minutes, I'll get bored. I can't be bored. Just out of curiosity, when I talk about praying for an hour, how many of you would honestly say, yeah, that just sounds so boring? Oh, you guys are lying through your teeth. All right, so here's the point. Guess what? Guess what? If you've thought that, then you have just pinpointed your next point of breakthrough. You ever walk around saying, I don't know what God's doing in my life. Well, he's trying to get you to live to, to get you to a place where you can pray for an hour. There, that's prophetic. You're welcome. <laughs> I don't even charge you for that one. Um, I instigate divine interventions. Satan's going to say to you, no, you're a victim. You don't instigate anything. Somebody's hurt you. 
Don't stop and think about the power that you have. Hold on to the fact that you're broken. Don't expect anything of me because I've been hurt. Hello? No. You instigate. You get up. You're the solution. Go look for problems. See, I think that's pretty good. But I must be about my kingdom business. Satan says, oh, but I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Haven't you seen my, my book? Let me, let me show you how busy I am. That's far more. Oh, see, now I'm meddling. And my greatness comes from my service. I had to write a letter of recommendation for a pastor. And I just came out and said, you can give him a license if you want to. But the bottom line is this. This man doesn't know how to wash feet. Love the guy to death. But it's just true. And if he came and preached in this church, you would smile and you would laugh and you would pat each other on the back and you'd say, that was a wonderful morning. But our example is Jesus. You want to know how blessed you are? How many feet are you washing? How stinky are the feet? That's kingdom blessing. All right, stand up. Let's say this. Look at your neighbor and say, clear your throat. Everybody clear your throat at once so it doesn't sound too bad. <clears throat> Here we go, from the top. Here we go. I am a new creation. I am God's work of art created for good works. I am an overflowing vessel of the Holy Spirit. I am free of sin and all its ramifications. I am a representative of Jesus to my world. I enforce Jesus' victory to my world. And I love the fight. I instigate divine interventions. I must be about kingdom business. And my greatness comes from my service. Friends, remember something. The reason you say this is not to prove anything to God. You don't say this to get blessings from God. You get this to align yourself so that you agree with God. I don't know about you, but I have nothing in my life where I want to disagree with God about. You might be smart enough to. I'm not. And I know what happens when I disagree with Jesus because I have some decades where that's taken place. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. All right, let's pray. Jesus, in your name, we just want to be more like you. We want to agree with you. We want to take the fight to the enemy. We want to set our friends and family free. We want to continue to intercede while you bring spiritual hunger to everyone around us. But Jesus, more than anything, we must have spiritual hunger. So Lord, before we go to bed tonight, make sure we have the time to spend with God. Lord, we pray all of these things in your name and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Have a good week. We will see you Tuesday night.